Next up, we have Barry Liebel, who in a couple of weeks will be celebrating his 50th anniversary in real estate. I had to turn around because everybody was like, oh. Now I see why everyone's smiling. So in a couple of weeks, he'll be celebrating his 50th anniversary in real estate. Starting, my 50th. Starting your 50th, okay. And he's going to be sharing with you some reflections on his 50 years in the industry from his time in sales, owning an appraisal business, being an instructor, a real estate columnist, expert witness across Canada, United States, Mexico, Panama, and the Caribbean. His resume is extensive in the industry, and today he's still selling after almost 50 years in Toronto, so it's all yours. I have spoken where all the electricity has gone off, all the equipment's broken down. You don't, I don't need a microphone, right? Okay, let me explain first why I'm here. I get a phone call from Andrew, and Andrew says to me, are you a proud Canadian? I said, of course I'm a proud Canadian. He said, do you believe in the Canadian way of life? I said, absolutely. Do you believe in the concept of free speech? I said, absolutely. He says, would you come to Collingwood and give one? <laughs> minutes, I'm going to talk fast, I'm going to do this fast, I'm going to compress a life of 70 years, and full, I'm starting 50 years in real estate this August. I'm going to compress it into 40 minutes. And what I hate is, I will not go to more seminars where a guy gets me up on a table screaming, I'm number one, and I'm going to do all this crap. There was a lot of failure. And let's, we're going to talk about failure. We're going to talk about rising beyond failure. We're seeing a real estate market that's changing right now. And a lot of you are scared. There's nothing to be scared of. Up, down, sideways. We get five points, goodbye, and heck with the rest of it. That's it. So with that said, I hope that some of my failures will encourage you to get past this hump that may be coming. We don't know, and it doesn't matter. So go ahead, it's Lebo, it's not Lebo, so I'm very fussy about that. With that said, if I did my, I was going to title this originally, Barry Lebo, My Fucked Up Life, but I was told that I can't do that, so I won't do it, okay? Um, my ex-wife will attest to that. With that said, with that said, um, it's been a fun ride. Now, uh, it's fun here today because my friend Richard Silver is here. Richard remembers a lot of the stuff I'm going to go through because he was there in those days too. I've been a realtor since 1968. There were 4,000 realtors in the whole Toronto Real Estate Board probably, and they were all full-time and they were all making money. And with that said, brokers didn't hire part-timers. Brokers controlled everything, and if you weren't good, they fired you. It threw you out. It's that simple. Um, and it was quite interesting. I sold 100 houses my very first year in real estate. I was 21. I had no education. We had no training. Nothing. I sold 100 houses. You know why? Because the public was ignorant. <laughs> and you know what else? So was I. I didn't know any better. I sold the first condos. I sold in Ontario. I sold the first Chinese developments in agent corps. So, and I didn't realize how big that was going to be. That was a mistake. Um, wow, well, was that a mistake? Uh, Riverdale. Once upon a time, about one in every three houses in Riverdale under renovation was mine. Once upon a time. And I've done seminars across all over this hemisphere, and I'm proud to be the chair, the founder of the Accredited Senior Agent Program. So, with that said, I love this guy. Oh, this guy's got such great stuff. We can all learn from our failures. What I've learned is how much it hurts to fail. Failure's not fun. They say you learn from your mistakes. I don't need any more lessons. I've had lessons. I've had enough. Enough of the lessons already. That bad decision. Did you ever notice? Talk about when I, Mrs. Smith was the sweetest client I've ever had. I have known Mrs. Smith's stories. She was sweet. She was nice. 
the son of a bitch that gave me all the aggravation. He's the one I talk about on a Saturday night. <laughs> the bad ones, the tough ones, the bad experiences make for great stories. Enjoy them. So I'm a kid, I was born in Fergus, Ontario, only because Arthur, Ontario, where my family lived, didn't have a hospital. And um, it was that simple. So, and that was me. Now this is true. I was the Gerber baby. <laughs> I was the 1948 Gerber baby. People who see my picture said my finger is still in the same place. <laughs> I grew up in Guelph, and we moved to Guelph. It's a picture of Andy Batty, who was the uh, uh, captain of the New York Rangers. He was a good boy from Guelph, a good Italian boy from Guelph. And at 10, I started golfing with Andy. I started taking uh, golf lessons. And I was a really good golfer. My father was a fanatic. At 16, I found another thing you could put in your hands called girls. And I realized that girls were a lot more fun than playing golf. And I stopped playing golf. It's that simple. So my era, my era was the era of the punk. And these are my folks. Now I want to tell you a little bit about my folks. I have never come close to making the kind of money my dad did. Does anybody know Northern Ontario? Have you heard of a town called Spanish Ontario? <laughs> my father owned it, yes. bought it, sold it, he flipped it with not one dollar of his money, and he was broke going into the deal. He was two million dollars ahead coming out. Okay? Not a dime of his own money. In one real estate deal he did in his later years, he made over three and a half million dollars in one commission. So that's who I come from. My dad was a hustler. My dad used to sit there and go, oh, you had a bad childhood. I didn't love you enough. Now get off your ass and get out to work and stop being sorry for yourself. That's what I come from. And with that said, my dad came from a tough, tough background. Now I'm an interesting generation gap, the gap, whatever. Both my parents went to grade 13. I got thrown out of grade 10. My parents had more education than me. So my, so my granddaughter, um, <laughs> dad was hustling at six years old selling programs down in the Maple Leaf Garden. Six years old because of the depression. Con Smite, who owned it, wouldn't let Jewish kids inside to sell. They weren't allowed in. So that was the type of Toronto that my father grew up in. The scars were strong. You didn't see people of color. There were very few black, brown. Anybody who was black lived in a Jewish neighborhood. That was the way it was. That was just the way it was. It was a different Toronto. 16, we moved to Toronto. And life changed for me. Life changed dramatically. I started hustling and everything else. I was a really outstanding student because I was outstanding in the hall. <laughs> from nursery school, I was thrown out of kindergarten, I got caught in grade 5 for smoking at 10 years old. Uh, smoking was great, you know what, my first, my first cigarette was the best cigarette I ever had, the last cigarette, I, I wrote an article, I don't know if anybody remembers, I wrote an article for Rem called How Real Estate Made Me Stop Smoking. If you're a smoker, I got into real estate because I couldn't take a boss. One day I'm driving on the 401 and I have to pull off to get a cigarette. And I realized somebody was telling me how to live my life. And I got so angry that I threw, I just got so pissed that I realized there's some kind of imperial tobacco's got control of me. I never smoked, I was three packs a day. I never smoked another cigarette in my life. Because I got angry that somebody had control of me. So and I still miss it. I still miss it. So, anyways, I got expelled and I won't get through all that crap. So I wasn't the guy. I went through some private schools. I went to kind of schools that you wouldn't fail in your father's check accounts. Um, they were good. And this is where I went. This is where I got my education. This is where I got my education. The best, my mother had a very close friend. Now, you know, everybody knows Ed Mervish, you know, famous, you know, honest Ed. His brother wrote books, a very good friend of my mother's. He wrote a comment in a book. He said, schooling you get in the classroom, education you get in the pool room. <laughs> it's profound. That was my life lesson. So I wasn't very good. 
but I love the music scene. Wendy, you know about this. Um, Wendy's here, she knows. And Toronto was wild. I was out to Medina. This is how we look. This is how we dress. This is life. Guys looked beautiful. Women were gorgeous. They smelled good. Everything was cool. Um, not all of us that hung out in Yorkville were hippy dippies. A lot of us went, we got dressed up and we went out to Yorkville. So it was a different, and she's went months. I see her going, yep, I remember. You were there, I was there. It was fabulous. The clubs, the good cars, all right. <laughs> I love the track scene. So I'm 19 years old. I'm a bouncer in one of the roughest Jamaican clubs in Toronto. 19, I'm 150 pounds. One thing I could do better than any other white Jewish guy in Toronto, I could run fast. <laughs> Anyways, I saw the drug scene from some of the people coming in. I have, that no matter what, I made a vow. I don't drink alcohol, never have, never had tolerance for it. I don't touch drugs, no matter, and this is part of the life cycle. And I want to get into that because I was a heavy smoker, I admit it. So 1967, here I am with no skills, <coughs> Israel goes to war, and I am a kid that wasn't, I was sort of a spoiled brat, <laughs> and something stirs inside of me, and I go to Israel. And I joined the army in 1967, six day war, I mean, the six day war was over in six days. By the time I got, the, the Arabs heard I was coming, they surrendered. <laughs> <laughs> with that said, that said, it was the greatest turning point of my life. A boy left Toronto, a spoiled rich kid, and came back a man. I also came back married, but that's another story. <laughs> I married my corporal, as a matter of fact. Um, but she always wanted me to be the commanding officer. So, with that said, um, I come in, I have no skills. Zero. My father says to me, go see Silva Murray Bush. Murray was a huge developer. Built 2,000 homes in his peak year. Go see my friend Murray, maybe get a job selling real estate. My course took one week. And I had, I had, I got no money, nothing. I'm lending you 150 bucks to rent that car. And at the end of the month, you better be able to pay me back. And I got into real estate, and the first two days I came home, I remember a Sunday, I saw I started selling at Bramley new houses. I made like two, three hundred dollars. I was making fifty-five bucks a week in my bets. Before, I got to get out of this. Stuff's wrong. This is you make too much money in this business. They're gonna put us in jail. I was really afraid we were making too much money. So I borrowed to get into real estate. I had nothing. I had no skills, nothing. And I started selling. And I went on to sell a hundred houses. I sold the first. That's the first condo, almost in Ontario. And that's 1968, that's Rex Day. And I sold for a guy named Leo Goldar. His son, Mitch, is the one who brought the Wall Martians into Canada, Smart Centers, and he released the Wall Martians upon us. So Leo looks at this 21-year-old skinny kid and says, what do you know about selling condos? Now it's the first condo in Ontario. I go, you know about building condos, and Leo and I are friends ever since. So, then I get into, I did so well in real estate, I got recruited to come into the mortgage brokerage business. We built one huge, and then I got arrested. <laughs> I got arrested. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. me who's Ukrainian here? Who's Ukrainian background? Oh, my priest is not here? Okay, so I, I ended up by mistake. We were protesting for Segan, who was the uh, premier of Russia at that time, and it was Russia with communism, and they wouldn't let the Jews out, and all the others, and the free... I went to protest, and by mistake, ended up in the Ukrainian demonstration. 19 Ukrainians, one Jew, gets arrested at the demonstration. It took me, the Ukrainian Congress calls me to speak, because the police went out of control. And the police charged the crowd, and went in with horseback, and started beating people. An 89-year-old man with two crutches fell against a policeman who was charged with assault, and it was really interesting. And I ended up speaking at the Ukrainian cons uh, Congress about what happened and everything. It was the first time I spoke in public. And people liked it, and I started speaking. So by being arrested, it was actually a very good thing. It also helps me when I go to the United States. Have you ever been arrested? Yes. Proudly. <laughs> and the word proudly. I said, I was arrested for protesting communism. Walking to the United States. <laughs> so, 
Then, this is about the years where we met Richard, back in the days when I had WFE developments. So WFE stood for we, everybody. Um, <laughs> I never liked that name. I did not choose it. It was my partner's choice. We had a beautiful set of offices in Roxboro and uh, Abbey Road in Toronto. We bought hundreds of houses. Not a house, we were buying, was buying 13, 14 homes a month, renovating them in those days, fluffing them, and reselling them. These are some of the houses we own. This is some of the list that those days, a thousand down, um, you know, look at the prices, 23, 29. I mean, we were just turning them over, turning them over, turning them over. We weren't in the renovation business, we were in the fluff business. And with that said, I opened my own Well, Vaughn, I still have those pants. I mean, now they're a tablecloth. <laughs> my girlfriend's here and she knows I'm still looking for a pair of shoes like that, the white and the black. They don't have them. Um, real estate's really good to me because that's a 1973 Cadillac, and today I can afford a 1973 Cadillac. <laughs> But, you know, I had my own brokerage, and things were great. I gave up smoking, Here's, and then I went on my own. Here's some of the houses I've owned. Here's some of the houses I've owned. Here's some of the houses I've owned. 600 houses. Bought, sold, and I went broke. Busted. Busted. Because of the Bill Davis government. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> the conservative Bill Davis. In 19, here's Lebo's axiom. Behind every successful business venture in the province of Ontario, there's a piece of pending government legislation waiting to wipe it up. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a great fan. So they run the land speculation tax, which was a failed tax, and it stopped the real estate business dead. Jesus, this sounds kind of familiar. <laughs> Wow. And then I had, a lot of you know Ralph and I are, Ralph and I are, of those hundreds of houses you saw, Ralph's firm sold me over a hundred. And that's Jimmy Mazzoni. Jimmy turned and changed my life. Jimmy was a World War II veteran. The Italians and the Jews in Toronto grew up side by side downtown. Jimmy knew my dad. Jimmy cut me one day. I'm going to the university to take the FRI course. I want you to come with me. Jimmy, I never even finished grade 10. You're coming. I go, Jimmy phones me about a week or two later. The forms are on his desk. I filled out as much as I can. You fill in the rent. You're not leaving here until you fill in. I'm sending it to the university. Jimmy, they won't take me. I never went past grade 10. I never went to grade 10. I went to university. I went to Jimmy. I got my FRI. And I got turned on. I have been going to university for the rest of my life. I've taken 30 years of university. And I can't begin. I think I've done 20 professional visits. So real estate has really changed me. I joined Trev, that wasn't easy, they didn't want me in. And um, then I started, I won't tell you the franchise, but the gold jacket was lousy. Yeah. <laughs> True story, I'm in the hotel, I'm at the Prince Hotel, I'm standing there, I'm wearing this gold jacket. I look like the old, uh, like the Odeon theater usher, you know what I mean? <laughs> American couple walks over, excuse me, do you have a table for two? I go, I grab two menus, I see them. The waitress is over there, I look at her and go, Maria, I'm going for you. Where are you folks from? I love Dallas. Wait, would you look after our friends from Dallas? I walked away, never wore the damn jacket again. <laughs> that's not a joke, that's a true story. At that time, we bought, I bought my franchise, the Polarskis, who ended up buying started Remax Drill Truck. We were all young brokers. We were in our 20s. We bought these franchises of Century 21. I wasn't a good fit. I was the first, one of the first in. I was also the first out. I'm not a franchise. I also found that I'm not a residential manager. I sold a lot of commercial stuff in the early days. I sold entire blocks downtown. Now you're thinking, what's the failure? What kind of failure is there? Well, when the spec tax came out, I was holding 53 houses. I was 26. I was, I was retiring for life. I was 1.5 million 1974 dollars in debt. In debt, I did not go bankrupt. 
I worked it in 18 months, I paid off every investor. 18 months of hard work. I was a son of a bitch. I would not have wanted to be in my life or my kids. I was terrible. I was obsessed. If a cop, I used to put up notices in bakeries and the police stations and fire halls. If you're on a midnight shift and want to see houses in the middle of the night, call me. I would take a lantern and go into empty houses with no electricity and turn and go show them houses at 2 or 3 in the morning. And I sold houses. And I kept doing that. And I ground it up. And no matter what happened, by 9 o'clock the next morning, I was showering, shaved, dressed, and in my office, no matter how late I worked. And I did it. And I did it. It was tough. Chinatown. We developed Chinatown. The Chinatown you know in Toronto, I sold most of the properties. Not all of them, but a large percentage. And we were doing all kinds of stuff. Everything was great. I built my own office building. And things were good, subdivisions. Uh, one of you the nerd Durham would know this stuff. And then the train wreck hits. Then the train wreck hits. <sighs> Mortgage rates hit 21%. The economy goes to hell. And of course, I learned my lessons well in life. You know, I'm not the kind of kid that sees wet paint. They only about 38 times to touch wet paint for a year. I should have wet paint. Um, and with that said, I bought a whole bunch more real estate. And I got more, I got mortgages now at 21 and 22 percent. The trust company who was giving me the loans went bankrupt. Well, not bankrupt, they got seized by the government. And what happened is I couldn't get my advances. I couldn't finish my projects. I was in serious doo-doo. And here's the first lesson. Whatever you do, go back to basics. A, B, C. Real estate's about A, B, C. It's nothing else. By the way, no matter what they tell you, no matter what they say, no matter how much is iPad, iPod, everything else, and I'm very advanced with this stuff, it still comes back to the human element. And the rest of it's crap. There are agents making fortunes. Creative Home Group, Richard, you probably remember these days. And when I had, I had great parties, by the way. Oh, the parties, I had a graffiti party. Everybody came, we wrote all over the walls, and belly dance, it's great parties. And this is Riverdale, some of the renovations. Then the shit hits the pan, my, and Ray Mac, and the scandal, and the great apartment flip that my father was very involved in. His partner, Lenny Roseburg, went to jail, and uh, they were my biggest client. The rug got pulled, and then um, there was an appraiser by the name of Labar, and people pronounced my name Labo, and I was blackballed. They thought it was me. And I had to go and prove over and over. I'm like this guy. Nobody would talk to me. It was really tough. You have no idea. So I opened an appraisal firm. And I was with this guy for 19 years. I opened an appraisal firm because I didn't put money on the table. 19 years together, we built a huge appraisal firm. And uh, it was a good year, except for one trouble. This is the type of stuff we were appraising. A lot of those are landmark buildings. Uh, right at the <coughs> Ottawa over there, the, the uh, Flatiron Building. I mean, we were all over Canada and the United States. And I started getting involved in UFI, and I did a thousand cases of UFI where I went to court and toxins. And, oh, by the way, I was supposed to be here this morning doing stigma for us first. Yeah, he was out doing stigma. So let me do that for one second. Disclose everything. Okay, now let's go. <laughs> so, this is my territory. This is my territory. I flew all over. And I want to tell you my next collapse. 40 cents cost me about three and a half million dollars. Cost me my marriage. It cost me everything I had. Um, we had done an appraisal. And it's very hard for me to put this in very fast words. We did an appraisal. And there was a mistake. And the mistake was going to cost hundreds of thousands. And I said, thank God we have insurance. The appraiser who did it turned around and said, well, I never put the stamp on, I never put the thing in the envelope to pay the insurance. I went, what? I paid for the insurance. I know, and I had to fight with the appraiser to go over something, and I didn't want to pay them right now. I said, I'm paying. We did have insurance. We had sued. <laughs> that lawsuit cost me a million nine. <laughs> And then I had to sell all the other real estate. It ended up costing me three mil in the 19, um, I remember even. With that said, I was broke. My marriage of 27 years went. 
because I was an impossible prick to live with. And with that said, one guy would have put one stamp on. I walked around mumbling to myself. There was mafia connections. Don't ask about this story. It's like unbelievable. The guy that screwed me, there was a defrauding. I got defrauded by somebody in part of this. He was connected with a certain group of people. I couldn't go after him, but don't ask. This was a plaza that I got stuck with. And I'm driving my Austin Healy. I, I don't care how bad. I can live in a basement apartment and live in one pair of jeans, but damn, I'm never going to drive a bad car. It's <laughs> <laughs> just not going to happen. So I kept my Healy, and I was so depressed. Like millions of dollars in the hole. My marriage, I wasn't nice to my first wife. And those of you that have met her, she's a lovely woman. She didn't deserve it. And I'm driving the Healy. Now, if you know anything about a Healy, they're, they're, they're British cars. I mean, they look great, but all the nice parts falling off them were crafted by fine British craftsmen. So, <laughs> what, what, what happens is, one night I'm coming along the Queenie and I'm thinking, if I just hit that embankment, my kids will never know it was an accident. Except it was an accident. And I had $3 million of insurance in that time. And I'm thinking about the insurance. I learned a lesson. But the thing is, I am. I have to know tomorrow what the next gadget is coming out because that's who I am. My curiosity is greater than anything else. So I have to know what's in tomorrow's newspaper, the next step technology. I just have to. So I couldn't kill myself because I miss out on all that action. <laughs> so with that said, when you're at your lowest and you're at your worst despair, that's your game. If that's me, that life's over. You just gotta go move. You just gotta pick yourself off. Have a, have a self-pity party. There is nothing wrong with a pity party. Don't invite anybody else. <laughs> Don't invite anyone. Don't be with sharp objects. And the other thing is, the other, well, it's very, you're laughing. It's hard. A woman gets up in the morning and does all this stuff in the mirror. A man takes a very sharp object, holds it up to his neck, and goes, do I go lateral or horizontal? <laughs> so, with that said, with that said, no matter what, never have a pity party that you have for a very long time. Next. With that said, luck doesn't happen because you deserve it. Luck happens whether you deserve it or not. Life goes on. So real estate lessons I've learned. So this is the one I told you about the government wiping you out. That's true. Um, this is about the, your specialty, your niche. Now, what makes you unique? What's your unique selling proposition? Why are you different than anybody else? If we get this stupid thing and they outlaw multiple representation, it's about the dumbest thing that we're all competing on price. And now nobody will do an open house again. Why would you bother? It's the stupidest thing I heard. I've got a whole thing on that, which we'll be reviewing. Um, mortgage rates, hey, we don't control it. I love this about real estate agents. Where's the market? Where's it going? What's happening? What's the difference? We're players. We don't control the real estate market. We're commission agents. We are commission agents. We are players in the game. We have no control of the game. Get with it. If you look at, there's a lot of different boards in this room. If your board has stats, go back to when mortgage rates at 21%, the worst, the lowest, the cracks, the crap. And guess what you'll see? People bought houses. People bought houses in the worst times because the desire on the house is greater than the reality. Next, average sale prices, they go up, they go down, we don't care. Does a stockbroker care if the prices are going up or down? The stockbroker gets paid. That's it, we get paid. I mean, I'm a 5% mentality, that's it, two and a half row, whatever. You can't control a market, there's one of the lists. You must recognize a market. Where are we today? I will tell you exactly where this market's going in six months from now. <laughs> you can't know where, when the train stops. We were talking outside. We don't know when the real estate markets crashed. We never knew it. We heard it, we knew it later because things started to happen. We may not crash, we may not. The people are coming to Canada in droves. It's a hiccup, but it's not forever. You've got to recognize your market. All markets will rise, all markets will also crash, but for a short time, all economists are wrong. 
pundits are wrong, and Darth Turner is always wrong. <laughs> Darth Turner once wrote an entire column against me because I pinned a book of his. I said, if a house doesn't do any talking, keep, you know, keep on walking. And he says, Barry Debo is a bad poet. <laughs> he did a team too? <coughs> He's a good guy, though. No matter how the no, 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 I did it. And says no. No matter how shitty the market, no matter how bad people want to buy houses, and the worst of times, you have to figure out the your share of the market. Next, you can't, you also, um, what inspires me? I grew up, I, my grandparents came here almost 110 years ago. My parents, my father and mother, they were alive maybe in their late 90s, both born in Toronto. My parents escaped, my grandparents and I, our families escaped the Holocaust, but a large percentage of my friends were Holocaust survivors, children. Most of my friends that I grew up with, their dear friends, were born in DP camps after the war. In Stuttgart, 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 Stuttgart. When I saw these people put their lives back together, no matter what has happened to me in my life, it's a hangnail. My life, my worst thing in my life, even the stare would go and says you may have cancer. It was a hangnail compared to what these people went through. So I looked at them for my inspiration. And I realized how, how selfish and self-serving. I love this. Napoleon Hill wrote the great books, right? And this is his great saying. I keep that as an affirmation on me. You come right now and say, Gary, I want to see the affirmation. I have the card. It's always your next book. So, real estate. You may be with the wrong office. There's nothing wrong with your career. You're just in the wrong place. Oh, your broker gives you 100% and pat your bum on Friday. It's great. <laughs> 2002. Worst thing of my life. I go to Lutz back in the apartment building in Kitchener for a client in Waterloo. And I said to the guy, something's wrong with this building. I smell mold. Nothing's wrong with this building. He says, open the door here. I want to see. Sure enough, apartments are what, empty and there's water on the floor. I said, I want to see the roof. I go up. I fall through the roof. I land on my spine. I learned a lesson. Never get driven to the uh, hospital. They won't look at you. Always get by ambulance. Always. With that said, I buried the walk. I'm 18 months with the cane. I should not be here today. I should not be standing. I'm in pain 24-7. But you know what? I'm the happiest guy in the world. Because I'm walking. I'm standing. I'm lucky. That was nothing compared to the car accidents that came out. Here I am. I lost a knee because of my healing. A woman took out my car. This knee's artificial. Um, I wanted my birth to get retracted by six months to wouldn't do it. Um, <laughs> so I've gone through that. And the other thing I tell agents, I always have disability insurance. So this is what a kidney stone feels like. <laughs> I've had 30 of them. I haven't had a kidney. If anybody wants to talk about kidney stones, they're how to prevent them. I used to be in the hospital every 10 months for 30 years. It's a true story. Every 10 months, I started getting something natural. I've been in the hospital seven years. Haven't been in seven years. Witness, I've been all kinds of stuff here, all kinds of associations. Um, I wrote this book. And I learned something about Aria. The old Aria, not the new. <laughs> never, I wrote that course, I wrote that text, and they never said thank you. Oh. Oh. That's true. <laughs> I do a lot of community work, and I'm proud of my community work. By the way, there's my very first deal right there. Ten thousand. I have commissions that are six times bigger than that. Um, I'm not very proud of this. I got a material, material, ugh, meritorious award for my service to the real estate industry from the real estate Institute of Canada. That makes me feel really proud. Um, with that said, all about awards. You go to Loblaws or Sobeys, take them your award and say, here, I was the salesman of the month last month. I'd like to buy groceries. It's bullshit. All you care about is your brokerage right. Pay to the order of and your name. The rest of it means nothing. Don't let the awards go to your head. I got a great family. My ex-wife, I give her a lot of credit. She kept the family intact. She was a great girl. And I've really been happy having a great family life. Um, I'm not going to talk. My girlfriend's here, so I won't talk about this part. <laughs> <laughs> um, which brings us to love and hurt. I went through a second marriage from health. 
And when I saw her get on her broom and leave me, I <laughs> <laughs> I met somebody, he was a very dear friend, a realtor, and I used to go out with her for, for you know, for a movie or something. And I said, I will never date again, I will never be with another woman. I don't also play for the other team, I just will never be with another woman. And I'm never going to happen. You and I will be friends, and when you're not with the boyfriend, I'll go to movies with you. And she manipulated me, taking up her friend. And we've been together now eight years. And love does come back into your heart. Everybody's looking at Vivian. <laughs> Something else. I came out of that marriage a million four in debt. Because I, I, when I was sitting there one night, I said, my father had just died. And I never had another uh, phantom experience or an extra spiritual experience. And I stay lying in bed and I'm thinking, if dad was here, what advice would he give me about my marriage? And I heard my father's voice come from the grave and went, fuck it, give her the money! <laughs> and I did. I walked away from the most gorgeous home, that was my pool, and divorce, some of that, hey, who needs furniture anyways? Uh, it's worth it. And it really was. <laughs> she, she left, she left. Anyways, um, we had a glorious, we had a glorious time. Lois Dix, my former partner, she bought out my firm, my appraisal firm, which still exists, and I started the credit senior agent, and I teach. And then we had a lot of fun doing realtor in the park, and that was a lot of fun. I didn't do it this year for different reasons. And this is the way it is, folks. You're too old to remember. I have an autograph. I have a real nice letter from Gene Autry. He wrote that song, I'm back in the saddle again. And it's a great song. Think about it. I'm back in the saddle again. Every time you fall off a horse, you get back in the saddle. In real estate, when you get off and you fall off your horse, you climb back on your saddle. I am going out now. You were talking about referrals. I have a check with me right now for a referral partner that gave me a referral in Kitchener. I am taking that to my office. No, you hand it to me, I get in my car, and I drive to Kitchener and hand that check to that person. Because I'm back touching people. You never stop touching people. I love you touch moms. <laughs> 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 They love to know you, but you met three years the last time. <laughs> okay. So, you know, and it's great, all the awards and all this other stuff, it's all fun. So, you know, number one, now here's the last thing I wanted to, some of you here are superstars. So my dad and I are sitting in the kitchen on a Sunday, morning and a buddy of mine makes it to the Toronto Star at a certain magazine every Sunday. And my buddy's there with holding keys on his hand. He says, the keys of the city. He's a super. My dad says, he will be out of business in six months to a year. So he's the biggest, one of the biggest real estate agents in Toronto. And you don't know who I'm talking about. <coughs> and my dad says, six months to a year. And I go, why? He says, he's going to believe his own bullshit. <laughs> be very careful being number one and getting all this ad net. Business won't come to you because of it. It doesn't mean a thing. It's great. It makes your aunt Sadie really happy <laughs> to know that that's my nephew, but it's not worth it. Okay? And like my dad said, they start to believe their own bullshit. You gotta turn around. Uh, I wanna write a book about self help books, how not to buy. A self help book, not how to buy self help books. Um, it's not, this is Vivian. She's here. She's with Sotheby's. She's a broker. She's my superstar in many ways. And she's a great realtor. And um, with, oh God, I swear I never dated a realtor. She fooled me. She became a realtor after we started dating. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the reality. Life goes on. When you're down, I was down $3 million plus dollars in 30-year-old money back. I've been down $2 million, a million and a half. And I came back, number one, no matter how late it was, 9 o'clock at the latest, I was dressed, ready to go to work. I never fail to show up to go to work, ever. And that's very, very important. You've got to do it. Lessons very quickly. No matter how much you can gain, always leave some money on the table for the other person. Never, ever take full advantage of another person. Despair 
If they're in trouble, be honorable. Okay? Am I honest? Okay. Never, never let a client see that you're hungry. Joe Girard. Anybody know who Joe Girard is? Was? He was the world's greatest salesman. Andy Sturman, who's whole life, you know, owns whole life. We went to see him um ten years ago. He said Joe Girard said his first deal was he needed thirty-five dollars for groceries, and all he saw was thirty-five dollars. You never let him see how hungry you are. Number two, know your business, and that is hard. I'm forty-nine years starting fifty. I have learned about forty-nine percent of this business. Learn to forgive sinners and sights. Somebody pissed on you, you want to piss back? Screw it. It's not worth it. They're up, they're living in your head, go dancing, folks. It's not worth it. Forget all the slights. And you know, even if you're wrong, you're better off. Tony Robbins 101. Forgive them. That's it. And never be envious. Somebody's a top producer. I got in a car two weeks ago, drove, I won't tell you which city. I went to see two top producers to learn from. I take top producers out for lunch and go, what am I doing wrong? How can I learn? And that's what you have to do. If you're a good producer, mentor. Lessons. I'll do this quickly. Learn your craft. Most people don't know real estate. Forget real estate. You've got to learn sales. Um, study, study, study. Be positive. Be with positive people. Negative. Oh, God. When I start, that's why I'm going to work out of an office. The guy with the white belt and the white shoes, hmm. always. Oh, he tells I have all the stories and it's got an old Cadillac too. Be very, very careful with bad hair piece. Be active in your office, but don't always have to be in the office. Be active in organized real estate. Those of you that are in boards, associations, some of the most rewarding things you can do is volunteer in real estate. Totally rewarding. Give back. Support a charity. 10% of all my income goes to Alzheimer's research at Baycrest Hospital. Is that simple? Give back. That's what I'm. That's why I'm here today. Because Andrew's giving back, and it's it's admirable. With that said, social media works. But remember, replace. You can contact. And last, we're the masters. By the way, I'm not very great about some of the newest guys. I love these guys. Jerry, Jeffrey Gittimore, what a great guy in sales. Amazing. Last of my lessons. Dreams are good, but goals are better. Make short, simple goals. <laughs> Awards, you can't buy groceries. Um, never cut your commission unless they are family or it works for you. You cut commission because it works for you, not for them. Find a niche, work it to death, become the go-to expert. Love. Let yourself be open to be loved. I hated myself. I never loved so much. Public. With that said, think about what you have to gain more than what you got to lose. And friends and family will do what's best for them. Your mother, your mother-in-law, your my best friend at the time, he was his parents were killed. He was raised by his sister who listed her house to buy somebody knocked on her door. He was an active broker. Okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm trying to Tim, I'm not trying to keep your time. Uh, go bankrupt if you have to get on with your life and just get on. Don't fight. You can always start over. We're we're great for second beginnings in this country. Have strong family support. If you don't get another family, um, <laughs> don't take out your fam your anger on your family, your dog, the cat dog. <laughs> uh, my thing, I was never going to get a big inheritance. My father made probably $25, $30 million in his life and died broke because he spent it. <laughs> Stupid thing to do with your money. Spend it. Um, so you have to realize that the only way you can make money is for you to go to work and sell pity parties only for convenience. With that said, the reason that you are not as successful as the achievers that you admire is that you have settled for less. I love that quote. I love that quote. I love that quote. That should be in everybody's head. Take a winner and lunch. Not just for losers. So with that said, um, give back. I've talked about that. And here's the question. I've been in real estate 49 years. How many of you are going to be here 49 months from now? <laughs> in this room, probably. The wrong people are not here today. The ones that need it. What lies behind us, what lies before us, are tiny matters compared to what lies with us. Ralph, Walt, Emerson. Yes, I have that affirmation on me. And that's it. That's my future. That's what I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> that's my future.
By the way, I, is it true too? I didn't know. I'm 19, I was working in a black bar in Buffalo as a go-go boy. All right. <laughs>